All right. Should we get started? Yeah, so they're, they're asking me to do three half hour kind of nutrition bits. So 30 minutes goes super quick. Um, my intent is to kind of give kind of a basic uh, rundown and then leave some time for questions because I think you guys probably have your own uh, questions on this. Uh, so my name is Marco Vespignani. Um, I'm a naturopathic doctor. Does anyone by a show of hands know what that is? Have you seen? Oh, look at that. Nice. All right. Right on. So uh, I'm licensed here in California and Washington. Um, kind of goes by state by state. Funny thing about California is I'm technically not allowed to say I'm a physician when I'm in California. I have to say I'm a doctor. So here, here I'm a doctor. Uh, <laughs> up there, a physician. It doesn't really matter. I'm the same person. Um, I have uh, my own practice uh, with some other docs in Seattle, and a large part of my focus is neurology, so I do a lot of treatment with uh, MS, Parkinson's. Um, I worked with a neurologist in Davis for about five years, so that's where I got a lot of my information about how to, how to deal with neurobiological conditions. Um, so, you know, I was part of the pre-lunch talk that was pretty in-depth in terms of autoimmune pathology, so, you know, when I put this together, I didn't realize quite how educated you guys all are. Um, so this is kind of a basic uh, review, kind of intended for people who aren't physicians. Um, you know, in general, immune cells are focused on the outside world. You know, the, your immune system is designed to protect you from other, you know, out there. Um, and usually what they're doing is targeting proteins. They're looking at particular things that are associated with certain bacteria, certain viruses, you know, a splinter or whatever it is, whatever proteins that you may interact with. Um, occasionally some sugars and things, but, but usually protein. And it's essentially designed to uh, protect you from some foreign material. Um, self proteins, uh, you know, they go through that thing that was described like the thymus, you know, educating is this cell going to respond? Does it respond to self or other? Um, so self proteins are usually recognized as that, as self and left alone. And autoimmune diseases occur and states occur when the immune system is targeting those proteins that are self. And in the case of NMO, you're looking at a very specific aquaporin protein. Aquaporins are these really interesting proteins that just allow water to move through certain tissues. We used to think water could just go wherever it wanted. Now I realize that there's actually these really discrete channels that water gets pumped through and all these you know, interesting pathways. Um, and so damage in an autoimmune process or really any immune process occurs through specific inflammatory and oxidative pathways. And so in thinking about diet, those are the two areas that I'm going to focus in on inflammation and oxidation, because those are the things that we can try to uh, adjust through um, dietary factors. <coughs> the first thing being inflammation. Inflammation is a normal immune response. You, you want inflammation. Inflammation is something that the body has set up to uh, protect you from certain environments. And it's a very, you know, discreet but incredible pathway, you know, there's things like complement, there's all kinds of, you know, T helper cells and B cells and, you know, interleukins and uh, cytokines and, you know, big hormones and little hormones and just how inflammation occurs um, is this kind of inflammatory response. You need it for protection. You actually need it to heal when you're starting a healing process. There's an inflammatory process there. Um, and you need it to adapt. I mean, one of the things, you know, thinking about like a callus or something on your hand, you know, you're adapting to some environment when you're using your hand lots, you get calluses, your immune system has that same kind of inflammatory response to adapt to new environments. Now, over in autoimmune sta states, something that's normal and something that's often brief, you know, a brief response to a, a, a virus, you know, I got hit with this awful virus last week, I'm recovering now, right? That was a short, discrete response and, you know, in time should go away. When you're targeting proteins that don't go away, when you're attacking self-proteins, that inflammatory response becomes more of a permanent response and so you never get that break. You never get that chance to actually, you know, reduce inflammation. Um, so the length of time the response is longer, it's more destructive because of this constant signal of inflammation. And the ability to heal, the ability to have that pause and in inflammation that then allows for the adaptation is compromised because you're not getting that chance to have a break. Um, inflammation is controlled by different processes and we have a good sense kind of with medicine about different drugs. Um, what 
many people maybe don't realize is that a lot of these drugs actually start out as natural substances and then you're able to kind of, you know, hone in and find out what's that specific active compound that's in a plant or in a fungus or whatever it might be and then make a drug out of it. Um, so one example is salicylic acid, which is something that occurs in mint. Um, so one milliliter of pure wintergreen oil, which comes from mints, is equivalent to about two grams of aspirin. So that's about 23 baby aspirin. So you think of aspirin as something that you take as a, you know, it comes in a bottle and it's little white pills and it's aspirin. Well, but that compound starts out in nature. It's something that grows in, in nature and, and we were able to kind of turn into a compound. And aspirin is a group of something called NSAIDs, which are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And they work on a pathway um, that's abbreviated as COX um, or even LOX. These are uh, cyclooxygenase and lipooxygenase pathways. So kind of a complicated thing, but when you're having an inflammatory response, there's different places where you can try and block that breakdown. Um, so when you're taking something, oops, like ibuprofen or naproxen or you know, Celebrex, which is a, a very powerful COX inhibitor, um, you're dealing with this same kind of inflammatory pathway that something like mint would work with. Um, and even interesting, something like turmeric. You know, how many of you have been hearing about how great turmeric is? Yeah. Mint? Yeah. Turmeric. Yeah, for sure. And even a coloring. I mean, sometimes foods that, you know, they just want to make orange, they'll put a little turmeric in. Now, with turmeric, and, and with anything, like, you know, with these mint, you know, you need this pure wintergreen oil, which is totally different than going out to your yard and pulling out some mint and chewing on it. I mean, there's a huge difference between, you know, pure oil and a plant. Something like turmeric, you know, uh, an eighth of a teaspoon that you might make in a curry is not going to have as much anti-inflammatory activity as a pill of naproxen, but it's going to have some. And you can certainly adjust how much turmeric you take, and it, you know, it starts to have a drug-like effect. And so you can think of it this way. A teaspoon is about five grams of something. So if you're, you're taking a teaspoon of something, it's roughly about five grams. And so five grams of turmeric, of food grade, you know, in a Costco tub of turmeric, has the equivalent activity of about two to 300 milligrams of ibuprofen. So you can balance that, you know, in terms of taking. Now you get this, you know, because turmeric has a combination activity, it does influence COX and LOX, whereas ibuprofen is just a COX inhibitor. You will get kind of a combination of anti-inflammatory effect from turmeric that you won't get from uh, ibuprofen, but you may not get the same you know, level of control of pain. Um, and, you know, if you've ever tried to put a whole teaspoon of turmeric in something, you know. You know. <laughs> well, it's, it's earthy, <laughs> you know. <laughs> it's, you know. Well, it's, you know, two grams of naproxen is a lot of naproxen. Um, you know, we'd have to think about how much turmeric that would be to try to, because, you know, that's, that'd be a lot of turmeric to try to take. And because it still works similarly, you're not necessarily free of any problems. It's just because it's a food doesn't necessarily mean that your kidney isn't going to suffer the same or your stomach's not going to suffer the same. It may not because it's kind of a broader effect. Um, I think one of the things that I really like about using, you know, plants and things from nature is that nature doesn't make anything perfectly. You know, everything's kind of a combination. There's, there's this synergistic effect. Um, whereas when you're dealing with compounds that you've made in a lab, it's everything is designed to be that exact compound, you know. Um, so you get kind of a broad effect from the turmeric. Um, and, you know, I, my intent is not also to say, well, you know, trade A for B. It's more to think about inflammation can be affected by things that you put in your diet, right? You know, interestingly, hops is something that has, there's, this is called N-kappa beta. This, this activity of anti-inflammation is actually stronger than this. So this, 
this is kind of a, a secondary signal of inflammation. And there's research now showing that hops can influence this N kappa beta. So, you know, when I was going through this with a friend, right, exactly, right? That's people from Seattle, right? They're like, oh, yeah, I'm going to drink my beer, you know? And it's like, yeah, well, you know, you're going to get some, some activity from the hops. But there are compounds now where they're actually taking hop derivatives and, and making, you know, supplements out of them um, without necessarily getting the alcohol and the wheat and everything else that might be in the beer. But... What's that? But what fun is that? Right, right, exactly. There are tumor subtypes yep. as well. Yep, yep. Absolutely. And, and they're often um, standardized to something called curcuminoids, which is the thought to be the active compound in there. And now, you know, because there's all this money now in, in supplements, you can, you can see the arguments between, like, oh, well, this is the uh, uh, lipo uh, form of the optimized curcumin that has eight times the absorption of the Mariva form, which is the, you know, arguing, you know, so each, each turmeric is better than the next, right? Um, and I do think that the advantage to taking supplements in some cases is that you know exactly how much you're taking of something. You know, you can say this, this has at least been tested by a lab. It's got 90% curcuminoids. It's 500 milligrams of turmeric. You can take it every day for three weeks and see, you know, am I feeling different during that time? Whereas occasionally, you know, having some curry or putting some turmeric in a smoothie, which I wouldn't recommend. But, uh, you know, you can, add, you can add food grade stuff and may not necessarily be the same from plant to plant. Um, and then moving up the anti-inflammatory chain is steroids, right? Many of you are familiar with, you know, doing like a dose of solumedrol. Um, Steroids are based around your body's own cortisol response, which is a, a protective mechanism within your body. Um, what's interesting here is that you get that cortisol response often in a state of stress or in a state of starvation. And so they'll do studies now looking at rats where they do caloric restriction. You know, they take a set of rats, they give them some you know, EAE or some other autoimmune type condition, and then they feed one set of rats every day and they feed the other set of rats every other day or every third day. I can CBD oil. Yeah, I can definitely I can definitely cover and, that. And like okay, medical yeah. marijuana. Or something. Yeah, yeah, uh, and that's often for pain control. Um, but I'll 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 leave some time for the the CBD. Um, so with with caloric restriction, what often you're uh, manipulating is this body's response to stress. And so it's, it's, it's interesting that if you have a body that is not being fed regularly, you might get an anti-inflammatory response that can help to control an inflammatory response that you won't get if you have a body that's being fed very regularly. So it might be good to go on a diet. Yeah. That. There's, if you put in caloric restriction and autoimmune, if you're, if you're searching for that, you will see lots of evidence around, basically there's these CR communities, right? Now, it's totally different to have a rat that you can control exactly what they eat versus a person that doesn't want to live like a rat in a cage. Um, but having the mindset of being hungry occasionally may not be the worst thing is kind of a shift for some people. So it's also important to recognize that foods can worsen inflammation, that some foods can actually make your inflammatory response stronger. And so, you know, specifically high sugar. So when you take a high sugar thing in, something that, that has, so one mental experiment I have people think about is, if you're about to eat something, imagine what would happen if you soaked it in water for 10 minutes first. Right, so a saltine cracker, a uh, marshmallow, right? Uh, would you still eat it? You know, if you took a piece of bread and put it in a bowl of water and walked away for 10 minutes and came back, are you gonna eat that bread? Probably not. If you take a carrot or a cucumber and put it in a bowl of water, 10 minutes later, it's a wet carrot. So there's a huge difference between how something breaks down. And now imagine that that bowl is not water, but hot acid like it is with your stomach. Now when you take that saltine cracker and you put it in your stomach, it doesn't stand a chance. It's going to get destroyed very quickly. 
the quicker that breaks down, the quicker that releases into your bloodstream, the faster your immune, your immune system, your, your endocrine system has to try to deal with that sugar. Your body really likes things to stay the same. You know, you want to be the same weight, the same temperature, wake up at the same time, go to bed at the same time. Body, the body likes something called homeostasis, which is a steady thing. So if you take a marshmallow and you eat it, your blood sugar is going to shoot up. Well, your, your body doesn't want that high sugar. It wants to bring it down. And so there's a response almost immediately to try to bring that sugar down. That response is insulin. Insulin in and of itself is an inflammatory protein. Insulin makes inflammation. So just by eating high sugar, you boost your insulin, which then boosts your inflammation. What insulin's doing is it's trying to pull sugar from your bloodstream and store it somewhere. Well, it's going to store it into adipose tissue. It's going to store that fat. Well, adipose tissue has its own response where it makes inflammation. This is uh, interleukin-6. So fat in and of itself makes inflammation. So a lot of sugar leads to a lot of insulin, which leads to inflammation, which leads to storage of fat, which leads to IL-6, which leads to inflammation. So you have this kind of feed-forward inflammatory response. There's also inflammation that comes from saturated fats. When they become uh, oxidized or, or kind of you know, inflammatory, and so that's a little bit what's based around this Swank diet idea, which is an MS diet. Swank diet, anyone familiar with? Yeah. So it, Roy Swank is a physician from the 40s who focused in on, on MS. He came up with a diet that was basically a low saturated fat diet. You're really focusing on not having really any saturated fat because he found that certain individuals who had a lot of saturated fat had worse uh, MS. There's also foods that improve inflammation Basically, it comes down to, I think, fiber. That the more fiber you consume, the slower you take up sugar, the more toxins that get broken out of your body. Um, and so by eating a high fiber diet, you can in some ways reduce how your body responds to what you eat. You know, it's basically taking in things that are harder to digest, you know, leaves and twigs. Don't eat that. Um, but if you, Comparing that to something like saltine crackers, you know, if that's the, the spectrum, the more difficult it is to digest something, the more energy is put into breaking it down, the more of that actually makes it through and then you, you know, poop it out. So you're drawing some of these toxins out. You're keeping sugar from getting into your system. Also, high fiber foods are more likely to be broken down by the bugs that are living in your gut. So things like, you know, the microbiome, right, which is a big fancy word that didn't really exist till a couple years ago. Um, so probiotics are, there's lots of evidence now showing how, what kinds of bacteria and how much bacteria you have in your gut is what regulates your immune system. I mean, you used to always think when I'm drawing a patient's blood, when I take the blood out, I'm looking at their immune system. What I'm really doing is standing over the freeway and measuring the cars that go by, you know, I'm kind of scooping some of them up and seeing what's there, seeing where they're going. I don't know where they live, I don't know where they work, I don't know anything about those cars, just like with the immune system when I draw that blood, I don't know where they started and where they're going. Most of the immune system lives in your gut. Most of the immune system is here to try to protect you from the outside world. If I pick something off the ground and ate it, you guys have an interesting story to tell, but I'd be fine. 99 times out of 100, there isn't anything on the floor that's going to hurt me because I've got this immune system and this really discreet system that can protect me. If I took that same thing and put it in my veins, I'd be dead by the end of the day. So there's a huge difference between something that goes in your body and something that goes in your body. Would you recommend buying the expensive probiotics? You know, I think there's, there's certainly some really good probiotics that have been shown to improve how the immune system works. Um, one in particular is called VSL number three. It's something that you can get at uh, VSL number three, like Walgreens, Costco. It's, it's what's called under the counter. So you, you uh, don't need a prescription, but you have to go to the pharmacy and ask for it. It's basically a pharmaceutically derived probiotic, but instead of having you know, 500 million bacteria, it's got 112 billion. So it's a very high dose probiotic. Um, so oxidation is another part of the body that is affected, you know, kind of immune process. Um, and so 
mainly the immune system is releasing certain compounds that are oxidizing. And then that oxidation is what leads to destruction, and then that's the thing that gets cleaned up. So when tissue's getting destroyed, that tissue's off of being oxidized, right? Oxidizing is how we age. That's how our body breaks down, is through oxidation. It's kind of like rusting on the inside. So antioxidants, the things that you hear about, that you want to take some antioxidants, are basically things that can help to put some barriers on how much oxidation happens because oxidation can lead to more and more oxidation. So you want to have these antioxidants as kind of barriers around that. Some antioxidants come directly from the diet and that's the only place you can get them and some antioxidants your body makes. So main antioxidants are the colors of the rainbow, right? So I always tell people, it's like Skittles. You want to taste the rainbow, but not Skittles because None of those colors are real. When you look at a pack of Skittles, every single one of those colors is based off of some chemical that reflects that light. The red from the red Skittle is completely different than the red from a tomato, which is lycopenes, right? So each of these colors has some biological activity. And so lycopenes, beta carotenes, bioflavonoids, chlorophylls, anthocyanidins, when you eat these colors, you get this biological activity of antioxidant, um, and so you need that each day. There's also a really important internal antioxidant called glutathione. This is a, a tripeptide. It's three proteins, or three amino acids that are stuck together as a protein. To make glutathione, you have to have N-acetylcysteine. This is one of the amino acids. So this is something that you can get from your food or something that you take as a, you know additional supplement selenium, which is a metal. So these two things are the, the rate-limiting parts of making glutathione. And then brassicas, which are your broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, uh, kale, uh, they, many of them have a compound in them called sulforaphane, which stimulates the production of glutathione. So by eating your broccoli, you increase the glutathione that your body can make. Um, and then specifically for the central nervous system, you know, when you're thinking about you have this, you know, oxidation of a particular central nervous system tissue, you want something that goes to the brain itself. And so melatonin, which is a, a central nervous system specific antioxidant. Now melatonin is tricky because you hear about melatonin having this immune stimulation activity. And so people will say, well, with autoimmune diseases, you don't want to take melatonin because it'll stimulate your immune system. And I just haven't seen any case clinically ever where melatonin was responsible for some, uh, you know, relapse or exacerbation of some type. You make melatonin every single day, so I have a hard time believing that it has some negative impact. Um, for, like, taking a melatonin supplement, um, what do you recommend? How much? It, um, because I take it every night to help me sleep. It's really person-specific because okay. There's three types of melatonin responders I've found. There's people who are low responders, where a half a milligram is all you need, and if you took any more, you're gonna be you know, groggy the whole next day. Okay. There's people that are high responders. If you don't take six milligrams, nine milligrams, you're not gonna have any response. And there's people who are paradoxical responders. You take melatonin, you're up all night, you don't feel well, you know, it's something that doesn't, doesn't interact well in your body. So I take 10 milligrams yeah. a night, and it seems to work, but I I have know. ALS patients that I give 300 milligrams a day to. Ooh, so, okay. you know, it, it really, it's a huge range. The thing about melatonin that's interesting is it's an antioxidant by itself. It improves the way you sleep, which improves the way you heal and it stimulates glutathione production within the brain, the endogenous activity of glutathione. So it's kind of a triple threat. It does three things at once. And remind me what the glutathione's That's, job is. Glutathione is the antioxidant. It is, it is the master, it's, and it's funny that I say this because there's probably websites that say glutathione, master antioxidant, but it is, it is essentially the buck stops here antioxidant. You know, vitamin C or vitamin E or whatever, all they're really doing is moving oxidation from one place to another. Glutathione is the compound that makes the difference. It is the antioxidant. It is the Mac Daddy. <laughs> and in clinical practice, I, so there's a compounding pharmacy that I use that makes glutathione. They make vials of glutathione. I put it in a syringe and I give it to people. I put glutathione into people's systems. Um, and with things like Parkinson's, I've seen some amazing results. So glutathione has 
has a, a real uh, biological activity. Yeah. You. It could. I mean, uh, you're at ten. You're probably doing what needs to be done. I mean, you could certainly go to twenty, but I think it's it's probably. So you know, my intent was to put some more funny things in here, but this is about as far as I got. Uh, <laughs> nailed it. Um, Another thing to be thinking about, and specifically to the immune system, is immunoglobulin. So when you're getting this blood test to see NMO, to see if you have this aquaporin uh, uh, positivity, you're testing an immune globulin response. Does your body make an immune globulin to, to that aquaporin? And so there's five types of immune-mediated proteins, these IgE, IgA, IgG, IgM, and IgD. I'm going to talk about the first three, mainly because the second two aren't as important in this situation. IgE, a lot of us are really familiar with. That's basically your allergy, right? When you have a, a peanut allergy that the kid has, they're going to swell up in a histamine response, or you're allergic to dogs or something. It's a, it's a histamine-releasing true allergy. Um, and then there's IgAs, which are more mucous membrane. Um, this is something like celiac disease, you're people who can't have wheat because it messes up their gut. It's because they have an IgA to uh, wheat. Then there's the IgG, which is something that we make in a lot of different ways. One way I'll explain to patients, it's like a tetanus shot. You know, when you go in for a tetanus shot, you're basically teaching the body, this is tetanus. If you ever see it, if you ever step on a nail, you want to be prepared so you have a memory to something. And so that IgG is this immune memory. And when it comes to certain things like foods, you can have this memory response to certain foods that you eat. So it would be good to know if you were reacting to a food like you would react to tetanus, right? Don't you think that would be interesting? Um, so when it comes to food reactions, you can have an IgE test where you go in for a skin scratch. You know, the, Take you to the allergist, they'll put a grid down, they'll put some eggs and some you know, dairy or whatever it is and see, does your skin react? Well, that's checking IgE. Do you have a histamine-based response to a food? Most people probably know, right? You have some shrimp and then you th swell up and you have to go to the ER. You don't have to really go to the allergist to figure that out. You know? It happens pretty quick. IgA might be a little bit harder because you may not know why your stomach's bothering you. You may not know that there are certain foods that you've had, you know, people go years without knowing they have celiac. So sometimes you have to go in and actually have a biopsy with an with a endoscopy and take a sample and see what's there. You can also do blood level tests. The problem with blood levels is that IgAs change. And so if you haven't had that food for four weeks, you may not make an IgA response to it. IgG can last for five years, ten years. You can have a huge response. Am I running out of time already? Yes. Nice. All right. <laughs> that went quick. Um, my daughter, um, she's two years old, and she's had a really bad allergy since she was a little kid. Mm -hmm. And she's been having allergies ever since. Oh, is there a uh, link between NMO and, and that? There's, there's immune types, right? I mean, that's kind of that chromosome 6 thing. Yeah. There's types of people who are more sensitive to proteins and their response to them. So there's certain HLA types where you're just more allergic. Yes. So what your body decides to fight, be it the aquaporin receptor or what, isn't necessarily known, right? So it's, you start off with a predisposition to maybe getting an autoimmune disease, and then it's just what happens in those first few years of life that dictate which one you so with. it will be a good idea to test her for NMO? Maybe. Yeah. I mean, I don't see why not. Okay. It'd be a good idea to test her. I would probably test her for foods. I'd probably test her for an A and A and just see what. They have tested her for the skin. So she came out high on fish, eggs, peanut, dogs, cats. Um, she doesn't eat meat. And she's two years old. Well, and up till four, the thymus is still active, so she could outgrow okay. some of those allergies because the, the tissue that's responsible for teaching self versus other is still alive okay. versus getting into you know, 15, 16, 20, where that tissue is not as active anymore. Okay. Um, I want to 
if we're done, I don't want to honor the CBD question. So what's interesting about marijuana is what activity it has in the body in terms of it's an anti-inflammatory, it's neuroprotective, it's pain control. I don't think there's very many things on this planet that have the, the level of activity with the lack of side effects and the lack of, you know, risk. I mean, in terms of there's very few things that, you know, even Tylenol, you take too much Tylenol, you're going to tear up your liver. You know, when it comes to, to the, something that's biologically as active as marijuana but doesn't have the, the kind of issues in terms of uh, getting the wrap it up, um, in terms of safety. So, you know, there's a lot to be learned about it, and certainly the oils and those things can have anti-inflammatory effects. So it's, I'd say the next five, ten years are going to be really interesting in terms of how much... Uh, Definitely, because the smoke is bad for you, right? So you absolutely want to, the, the problem with the edible is the dosing, right? And that moving away from THC types and moving more towards CBD. So figuring out, you know, hemp has a lot of CBD and not much THC at all. So in that sense, it's better than kind of sativa or some of the other types. One quick question about the vitamin D. Yeah. Uh, I can't believe how much I didn't get to. Yeah, this, <laughs> one specialist says take high dosages because you're in NMO, and then the general practitioner says don't take it. What's yes. your thought on it? Don't listen to the general practitioner, <laughs> right? I mean, if you go back 10 years, they said you didn't take vitamin D at all, right? We don't need vitamin D, right? So typically four to 5,000 I use a day is a safe especially being African-American, you, you really have to be taking more because you're not making any vitamin D 